Our scripture for this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs, sorry, the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he, that he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to, me to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed and to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The word of God for the people of God. So as we continue in our series in Ephesians this week, we turn to the second half of the letter that Paul has wrote to the church in Ephesus. Now in the first part of the letter, we are told about all the wonderful things that God has done for us. And as we saw last week, the first part closes with the prayer uh, that Paul had for readers that they begin to understand God's abundant love. Well, in this part of our reading, we find Paul moving into the portion of the letter that can be described as the calls to discipleship. I think you can sum it up best this way. The first part of the letter is what God has done for us. The second part of the letter is what we should be doing for God. So in the first part of our scripture for today, we find Paul appealing for a sense of peace to be found among the believers in the church. Paul is calling for unity in that community of believers. And oh, how we would love to live up to these lofty measures, that we be humble, gentle, patient, and bearing in love with one another. Oftentimes, these things can seem like they are unachievable for us. How can we be humble in a world that calls us to put ourselves up as the most important thing? How can we be gentle in a world that calls for us to be brutal? How can we be patient when everyone and everything we come across is just so annoying? How can we bear in love with one another when we are told to hate the things that are different from us? Now, each of these ideas seem like they are impossible for us to achieve in this world that we live in and in a time and place where we can find ourselves divided so easily. Surely these are just outdated ideas that the church at the time when Paul was writing Maybe they would have been able to achieve them, but us today, there's no way. Well, I think we need to first acknowledge that the people of this time would have been experiencing the same type of problems that we have today. You see, by and large, human nature is the same then as it is today. 
Do you think in their midst at that time they didn't have people that were bragging about all that they had achieved? Do you think that they didn't have people that were overly harsh with one another? Do you think they didn't have their share of hotheads that would blow up when something annoyed them? And do you think they didn't have people that were full of anger and hatred instead of love? You see, they would have been dealing with the same problems and struggles that we deal with today. And Paul was calling those people into unity, into the body of Christ. 2,000 years ago, and he is calling us into the unity in the body of Christ today. It seems like a tall task to achieve these ideas on our own. And well, you are right if you feel that way. See, on our own, we will fail to achieve these things. We will fail to achieve humility, gentleness, patience, and love. So I guess we'll shoot for two out of four, right? 50%, that's pretty good. On our own, it would be pretty good. But you see, we are not on our own. We that have accepted Christ never have to face anything on our own. As such, I believe that we can achieve these things. It is not some pie-in-the-sky hopeful thought that we can live together in unity in the body of Christ. See, I believe that as a community of believers, we can accomplish those goals because I believe that we can live our lives in humility, gentleness, patience, and with love because of the grace of Jesus Christ. If that is where our focus is, we can achieve those things. And that is what Paul is calling to the church in Ephesus to do. He tells us in verse 4, there is one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And if we can hold fast to those tenets of our faith, if we can put our trust and our heart into that one Lord, then brothers and sisters, the other parts will come much more easily to us. Now, the good news that we get from Paul, other than just being called into this uh, unity in, in, of discipleship, is that we are also given gifts by God to help us on our course. God has given us all gifts that we are to use in order to attain greater understanding of the gospel. Some are prophets, some are evangelists, some are shepherds, and some are teachers. We're given these talents so that we can use them for the betterment and to further the kingdom of God by helping others to be ready for the works of service in God's name and by serving the Lord ourselves. Now, we are also given these talents so that we can help others towards the unity in the body of Christ. But why would that be important to us? Well, in another case of the more things change, the more they stay the same, we find the people of Paul's time were struggling with outside influences. You see, the unity of their church was being tested by things like other faiths, wrong ideas about Christianity. The people of Paul's time were struggling to understand what the message of the gospel was really all about. They were finding themselves getting bogged down in small discrepancies of ideas, and it was causing division inside their churches. Sounds familiar, right? Hey, should we have communion every Sunday or just one Sunday a month? Now, when we have communion, should the bread be regular bread or should it be unleavened bread? Should we allow food to be eaten in the church basements or is that a violation of the sanctity of the church? And oh boy, don't even get me started on baptism. Should it be a dunking? Should it be a sprinkling? Should it be in the creek? Can it be in the river? Can it be in a swimming pool? Does that matter? You see, they were struggling with these ideas of how to understand them much the way that we struggle today. And if you don't believe that we struggle with those ideas and those things today, um, simply look at the number of Protestant churches there are and all the different branches and then trace the breakaways to the difference in scripture interpretation. And you will find, that yes, we do indeed struggle with those doctrines at time. 
Now, Paul even points out that there are people that are coming and trying to be uh, deceitful in their schemes to turn people away from the church and its true purpose and unity. During the time when Paul was writing this letter, there were people that came and they claimed to be super apostles. That is what they are called uh, theologically. Super apostles. And I know that that sounds funny, right? Like, do they think they were Superman or something? Why super apostles? Um, but these people would go from town to town and they would teach their brand of Christianity. They would say things like they had been there with Jesus and they had heard him speak and they were given mighty powers. And look at the things that I can do. When in reality, they were simply con men looking to make a buck. Again, how things have remained the same in 2000 years. Do we not see people doing that today? Do we not see preachers, and I use that term very loosely in this particular instance, using the gospel as a way for them to grow rich? Send me your donations and I will send you a blessing. Send me your money and I will make sure God sends it back to you tenfold. Yes, we do indeed see these things in our own world today, just like the church of the first century. And we need to make sure we are not allowing them to sway us from the true gospel. Now this may sound strange, but I actually find comfort in the fact that the people of the first century church had struggles that we still have today. And I know that sounds weird because shouldn't we have overcome those obstacles by now? Shouldn't we have moved past that? Shouldn't we no longer be falling for people's tricks? And shouldn't we have perfect unity as a church at this point? Well, I find comfort in the fact that we continue to strive to find that unity. That we haven't given up in finding that unity. You see, people don't grow when everything is perfect. We grow after we face adversity. I want you to think of it this way. An Olympic weightlifter doesn't get to be as strong as they are by lifting the same weight that they started out with. You can't hope to grow to that great power by lifting a five pound dumbbell every time you work out. You have to continue to up the weight each time so that you challenge yourself to grow stronger. And the unity of the church is the same way. We can allow ourselves to just be content where we are and when we face crisis, we may fold. The other option for us is to continue to grow in our knowledge, in our dedication, and in our service, and in our love for one another and for Christ. And so if we continue to do this, then we will find that when a problem does come, we will be able to conquer it because we have become stronger. As Paul said in verse 15 today, speaking in the truth, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Meaning we are to speak the truth to one another in a loving way so that we as a body can grow into something that is worthy of our head, which is Jesus Christ. Finally, I want to speak to the ultimate point that Paul is trying to make to them, and it is this. There will be disagreements in certain areas. However, we all need to be in, in agreement that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for our sins, he was resurrected and sits at the right hand of God, and our salvation is through him. And if we can do those things, if we can live in unity with peace, love, and patience with one another, and if we can use our gifts that God has given to us, then we can begin to transform this world into one that is worthy of the gospel. My challenge for you this week is this. What is one way that you can contribute to the unity of the body of Christ? Do it this week. Amen.